So in this video, we're going to explore the hormones involved in fertilization and implantation. If you haven't seen my previous two videos on the female reproductive axes or the structure of the ovary and the uterus, please go back and watch that now. I'll attach links in the comment section. Okay, so let's jump right into it. We'll start off with the release of the ova from the ovary. So the ovary is this entire structure here. Now, what hormone results in the release of an ova from the ovary? The hormone is LH. And this occurs at day 14 of the female reproductive cycle. LH stands for luteinizing hormone. So we have ovulation occurring, and I'm going to draw the ova in purple. Now the ova goes and sits in the outer one-third of the fallopian tube, and it remains there for approximately a day or two, waiting for fertilization. Now we're going to explore case one, where fertilization does occur. So remember, fertilization is a process of the somatozoa meeting the oocyte. You then form a zygote. And the zygote I'm going to now include in a dark blue. And what happens is the zygote undergoes mitosis. It replicates. And that's what you can see occurring here. And this mitotic process occurs all throughout this entire passageway, all the way until implantation. Now, if fertilization was said to occur at day one, the process of implantation occurs at day seven, approximately one week after the process of fertilization. Now, implantation is a very important process because the actual embryo releases hormones at this stage. So I'm going to draw the embryo here. So these are all the cells that make up this embryo. And remember, the technical term for the embryo at this stage is blastocyst. And that's because when you zoom into this clump of cells, you should be able to see an inner cell mass. This inner cell mass is the actual embryo and consists of embryoblast cells. So we're just going to write inner cell mass. Now, the outer component of the cell, this entire empty component, is filled with fluid called blastocele, hence the term blastocyst. Since we've recapped that, let's just understand the blastocyst implants. And when it implants, it releases a very important hormone. The name of this hormone is beta HCG. And this stands for beta human chorionic gonadotropin. It's a big name, I know. The word chorion simply refers to the placenta. And that is because the actual specific cells of the blastocyst that release this beta-HCG will go on to form the placenta. So now we get the release of this beta-HCG. And the beta-HCG is very important because it travels in the bloodstream and it goes and acts on this ruptured follicle. Now remember, at this stage, the follicle doesn't contain an ova. The ova's already been released. So it's just an empty follicle. So what does it do? It's still very important because it releases two very important hormones that maintain and proceed pregnancy. Those two hormones are number one, your estrogen, and number two, your progesterone. 
Now you might remember it's the ovaries that release these two hormones. And specifically now you know it is the follicle. It is a ruptured follicle. We have a fancy name for this ruptured follicle. We call it the corpus, with corpus meaning body, and luteum, which refers to the luteal phase of the reproductive cycle, which is everything after ovulation. Do you remember what the hormones estrogen and progesterone do? Estrogen is very important for the growth of the endometrium. So the endometrium is simply this thin layer from approximately there to there of lining cells. Now, estrogen causes the growth of these lining cells, and it's the same for progesterone. The growth ensures that there's adequate nutrients for the incoming blastocyst to use to develop into an embryo and fetus. So you can clearly see that the estrogen is supporting the pregnancy. Progesterone also grows the endometrial lining, it maintains the lining, and it prevents uterine contraction. Now, it logically makes sense that if we contract the uterus, this space will narrow and it could damage their blastocyst and embryo. So preventing uterine contraction by progesterone allows the pregnancy to continue. Now remember, it's a corpus luteum that releases these two hormones. And what causes the corpus luteum to release these two hormones? It's the beta HCG. If there is no beta HCG, you can infer that the levels of estrogen and progesterone should sharply fall. So this is the normal pregnancy, and you can clearly see we have fertilization, we have implantation, we have the release of beta HCG, and we have continual high levels of estrogen and progesterone supporting the pregnancy. Let's compare this to an alternate scenario where there is no fertilization and no implantation. So remember, it's day 14 which causes the release of the ova. And do you remember the hormone that was responsible for that? It was your LH, your luteinizing hormone. Now immediately after, the ova goes and sits in the outer one third. And what process occurs here? It's your fertilization. So in this case, we're gonna imagine a normal female reproductive cycle where she does not get pregnant and there is no fertilization. So if there's no fertilization, we're not going to get movement of that zygote and subsequent implantation. So that does not occur. So do we get the release of beta HCG? No. So I want you to recall, as there is no fertilization, there's going to be no implantation. And if there's no implantation, there's going to be no beta HCG released. Now, do you remember what beta HCG does? It travels in the bloodstream and it goes and acts on the ruptured follicle. What did we call that? It was called the corpus luteum. So now we don't have beta HCG being released. And what that does is it causes degeneration of the corpus luteum. You can almost think of it as the corpus luteum needs beta HCG to survive and continue functioning. So now there's no beta HCG, the corpus luteum is going to degenerate. And it degenerates into this scar like tissue here. And you can see a proper formed scar here. This ovarian scar has a formal name known as the corpus albicans. And this is non-functional tissue, meaning there's going to be no estrogen or progesterone released. So to sum it up, no implantation equals no beta HCG, and no beta HCG 
equals to a dysfunctional corpus luteum. So it degenerates to the corpus albicans. And what that does is it causes a drop in your estrogen and a drop in your progesterone because the corpus luteum is not releasing those two hormones anymore. And what that does is it causes constriction of the spiral arteries that supply this endometrium. And if you block blood flow to a tissue, do you know what happens? It doesn't get oxygen. It doesn't get glucose. It cannot make ATP and it dies. And it dies and sheds. And that is day one of the five day menstrual cycle. And also day one of the 28 day female reproductive cycle. And that is an overview of the hormonal changes that occur if fertilization did occur versus if fertilization did not occur. Thanks for watching.